Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I am here today with Miguel, and we're going to be filming um, a video that I wanted to film a couple of weeks ago, the second part of misconceptions about Christianity. Mm -hmm. But what happened is I filmed the entire video, by the way. I've had it in my computer filmed for about a month now, but I didn't like the way it turned out. Um, nothing I said is going to be different than what I'm saying today, but it just felt like I needed to bounce ideas off of a person and it felt weird doing it by myself. So I scrapped it, uploaded other videos, um, and then asked Miguel if he would join me for this one. So Miguel is going to be, is going to be talking to us about misconceptions about Christianity. So before we jump into the six, we have six misconceptions. Maybe you can just share a little bit about who you are, how God got you to where you are and ministry, family, all that kind of good stuff. And if you yeah. would just take a couple minutes, I think we'd like to hear that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so as Victor said, my name is Miguel. Um, man, uh, I've known Victor now for about eight years. Yeah. Something right? like Close that. Close to 10. Mm -hmm. uh, met back in like 2015 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so my walk started soon after high school with Christ. Um that started around 2014. The Lord started really working me around 2010. That's when I met Marita, which is my wife. Uh, her parents were pastors in Reynosa. Uh, and so little by little, they were uh, sharing the gospel through deeds, um, you know, through loving me and caring uh, for me, even when I was rebellious. Uh, so they really showed me and taught me about grace in a way that I didn't understand at first. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think towards the end of high school is when the Lord really probed my heart in a way where it was rather crazy. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about that maybe another day because uh, it's a pretty long testimony. Uh, but overall, he, he probed my heart and he really ended up breaking me and uh, helping me see his grace. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then a couple of years later, uh, we, we met at church. Uh, we met at a church where, you know, we became a little closer. Um, after that, um, the Lord started taking me through uh, really wanting to serve in the church and do, you know, more things in the church. And so little by little, I uh, came back down from my job uh, from Corpus, uh, started serving in our church. Uh, and it's been about five years now that I've been faithfully serving. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm here, uh, a deacon of my church. Uh, so that's been really fruitful, really great. Uh, the Lord is really doing great things, uh, not only in our church, but, you know, throughout the valley. So right. I think that's really great uh, seeing the, what your church is doing. Um, and so, yeah, I think overall, um, what else could I share? Uh, I have four siblings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have my sister, which is the oldest, uh, my brother uh second oldest and i'm and it's me i used to be the youngest and now we have my little brother which is he's right. 10 years old uh it's pretty much my size <laughs> he's <laughs> a big kid uh and yeah that's that's part of me i have my wife maritza uh man it's it's been such a journey with her and 10 years knowing her uh going on three years married so wow. that's been that's been awesome so yeah yeah well that's awesome man and we've gotten to do some fun stuff we went to we went to New York together <laughs> with uh, Stephen Priscilla Perumala at the Grace Place in New York. So if you're in New York City, check them out. Yeah. So we got to do that. I think I saw you preach your first sermon for Inversion, mm -hmm. which is a youth internship that I used to do. And I think you preached for that, right? Yeah. And I think that was your first sermon, if I'm not that mistaken. That was my first yeah. sermon. Yeah. And then in December or November, I heard you give your first Sunday morning sermon, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. Um, I don't remember what book of the bible you were in but but i remember being there and just pretty cool man i got to see kind of cool spiritual moments in your life <laughs> despite us going to different churches for most of our most of our christian walks so i've gotten to kind of see that so yeah. i'm excited and for anyone watching miguel is starting a podcast in the next foreseeable future <laughs> so so keep an eye out for that whenever it does go live i'll put it on a post or something on my channel so y'all can can check that out um but yeah so I wanted to talk about the second part of Christian misconceptions because yeah. Christianity, global religion, more adherence than any other faith that exists. Mm. Um, but it's also the most misunderstood religion, the most misunderstood faith. And there's so many variations of what Christianity is that mm. people have forgotten 
um, a lot of what makes Christianity what it is. And with that have come a lot of misconceptions, you know, things that you hear and you think, oh, yeah, that sounds true. Uh, but when you look back into the scripture, um, it isn't true at all. Yeah. So those are some of the things that that we're going to tackle today. So before we start, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say or address. If not, we'll just jump in. No, yeah, I think uh, what we're going to talk about is going to be something that uh, the misconceptions happen a lot because of the context, you know, like taken out of context, a lot of themes in the Bible, a lot of scripture that's used, uh, you know, some ways uh, inappropriately. And so I think we're going to talk a lot about, you know, these things that are pretty uh, obvious sometimes that are taken out of context. So we'll see. All right. Well, sweet. Let's do it. So the first misconception that we have is that the Bible has a low view of women. Mm. So Miguel, you want to start us off with that one? Yeah. So I feel like this one came to mind. What came to mind first was how I've seen my family uh, kind of use scripture to, mm. uh, you know, make women or make women look less of, uh, make it seem like it's almost machismo, you know, like they, they have this, um, masculine pride like i'm the man you're the mm, woman yeah and so you have to obey me uh th there was one time i was in a cookout where uh my uncle made a joke where it's like he would look at, at my tia and he went you know touch his rib and he's like hey you come for me here you oh know? yeah and so i'm like dang and this, this guy you know like does he does he know what he's doing yeah uh, and so that was basically he was doing that in the sense of like hey you need to obey me and you need to submit to me because I'm the man. This is the order that God created. Mm. So he got somewhat of the concept. But at the same time, he was kind of using it for his own uh, power. And so yeah. that's why I started seeing where it's like people take the themes off of, out of the Bible and use it and apply it in their own ways to right. you know, manipulate women. And so, yeah, that's one of the first things that came to mind when it came to the low view of women and yeah. how people misinterpret it because of how people apply it in the right lives. yeah and certainly it's true that that eve came out of the side of adam mm. um but it can't be ignored that both of them were equally and fully made in the image of god yes um so regardless of which one came first they share an equal dignity equal mm. value are equally deserving of respect jesus died for them both equally he didn't die more for men because they're more valuable or anything uh but they're they're equal in dignity i think that's what i want to to continue reiterating. Mm. And then you can see this throughout the scriptures, because in the Old Testament, um, if you go back in time with us, in the Old Testament times, uh, there wasn't a lot of protections for women. Mm. Um, a man could divorce you for whatever reason he wanted. Um, you were treated like property, essentially. You weren't an equal alongside your husband. You were just cattle, essentially. I mean, you were just a piece of property. And your your purpose, your sole purpose was to pleasure the man and to bring forth children, mm. hopefully male children, so they could have an heir, um, but definitely bringing forth children. So in the Old Testament times, in the ancient Near East, there was no protections for women. There was no rules regulating that they would have a good life or anything like that until the Jewish nation comes around, until Israel comes around. And they did. They were the only nation in the ancient Near East. They were the only people group in the ancient Near East that had um, these sort of provisions and protections for women. Um, a Hebrew man couldn't just divorce his wife for, for no reason. If he committed a terrible act against a woman, uh, he could be stoned and killed because mm -hmm. the women mattered in Israel because they were made in the image of God. Um, so even from the Old Testament moving forward, we see this just difference between the way that the world views women mm -hmm. and the way that the um, Israelites viewed women because they viewed women through the lens of the scripture. Mm. So then that's the Old Testament. But even when you go into the New Testament, um, Jesus highly valued women. Mm. Jesus allowed women to be with him. Jesus allowed women to sit at his feet and learn from him and glean from him, a mm. place that would be reserved for the men of the time. Yeah. Um, but Jesus invited the women. And then whenever he's resurrected, the first people to, to witness him and to mm. go and tell of the good news of his resurrection were women of, as well. Um, so so the Bible actually has a totally opposite view of women than than sometimes people believe because yeah. people do think, you know, yeah, you're just a woman. You come from my side, you submit to me, you mm. just, you are low and I am high and God made me Lord over you. So you figure it out. 
Yeah. Um, and that can happen where people have a misconception that that women are some kind of second class citizen in the yeah. kingdom of God. Yeah. But <clears throat> yeah, I think a verse that I found that I kind of want to talk about a bit was mm -hmm. uh, First Peter three one through seven. Mm -hmm. uh, he it's basically summarizing how where women need to submit to their husbands. Uh, and so I'll read one and two where it says. Likewise, wives must be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, that they may be won without a word by conduct of their wives. Mm -hmm. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, uh, the braiding of hair and putting of gold jewelry of clothing you wear. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but in general, there were giving this concept of how women were supposed to submit to their husbands in that take that husbands will come to know, you know, the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like uh, if you can elaborate a bit on how, like what submission was, because I feel sometimes now people hear the word submission, it's like, you know, it's, I guess, due to experience, due to what's, you know, the way it's taken out where it's mm -hmm. like, now it's just comp like a, a slave, right? you know, it's, it's a dirty like, word to submit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know if you can elaborate on that where, you know, this is in mm -hmm. the New Testament and, you know, it's being asked of the wives to be submissive. You know, what is it that? Yeah. Well, I think that I would preface the whole conversation um, by talking about who someone submits to, mm. um, because first of all, everyone's called to submit, mm. because every person is called to submit to the authority of Christ, to the authority of the church, whatever you want to say, but they're all called to submit to the authority of the Lord. So we're all called to submit. Um, the thing is, we're called to submit to someone who is good, who is gentle, who is loving, who always seeks for our best interest. Mm. Um, and so it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to submit in that situation. And then when you turn, because you were reading about marriage, when you turn into a passage <clears throat> that's talking about marriage, mm. this is idealistic talk right here. But hypothetically speaking, the wife submits to her husband because the husband is loving her the way that Christ loved the church, mm. right? And that's Ephesians chapter five. You can go, whoever's watching can go and read it for themselves. Um, but that's part of <clears throat> that's part of the conversation is that as Paul is talking about submitting, he is simultaneously calling the husbands to a very similar standard, right? Because what is love if not self-sacrifice? Mm. And if, if love really is self-sacrifice, that has hints and notes and aromas of submission all over it, mm. right? When Darian, my wife, when Darian wants something and I don't want it, if I'm going to be loving to her, then that means that sometimes I'll just give a terrible example. Sometimes she wants Domino's pizza. Mm. I prefer Peter Piper pizza as a good Valley boy. Um, <laughs> but I, I love her. So sometimes I say, okay, we'll have Domino's instead of Peter Piper. Um, that is an act of submission in my love i am choosing to bend the knee and to submit to her will that doesn't make me less masculine that doesn't make me less christian less godly less of a leader or anything like that it's just what love would require of me so people focus on the word submission and it is a heavy word i mean to submit is to say hey i'm gonna become low for you uh. Um, but husbands are called to the same standard yeah. to make themselves low for the benefit of the other person. That's good. So while hus so while wives are submitting, husbands are self-sacrificing for the wife. So it's this beautiful give and take from the husband and the wife. Yeah. Um, as far as, because I think technically you asked me what submission is, mm. um, I would probably not elaborate too much and just say it is the act of bringing yourself low mm. and giving the other person the right away. Mm, that's good. Um, and we're both called to it in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think the one thing that I hate is that people tend to hear submit and that's all I use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't go into the context of what you just elaborated. Right. And so that's the downfall of where, you know, people will say, well, you know, people who know the Bible, then this is the conception of what women are. Mm -hmm. uh, when in reality, similar to what you were saying earlier, right? In Genesis 127, God created man, male and female in his image. Mm -hmm. First, we we're all created in God's image. We are created to honor and glorify God. Um, right? Our, our gender uh, does not give us a higher, a higher stature. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where um, we come back to the ground where it's like, we are all in God's image. We're all uh, equal. Uh, we're all created to glorify, you know, yeah. and praise the Lord. And so 
our gender doesn't make us better, but it does give us different responsibilities. Right. So, yeah. It's similar um, with the leadership structure of the church, right? The elders together, the plurality of elders lead the church together. And yeah. in that way, they have um, a, a type of responsibility that maybe I don't have or you don't have or some of the other people in the church don't have. Mm. Um, different responsibility. And the church is called to submit to the authority of the elders, ultimately to Christ, right? Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that anyone else in the church is less than. Mm. It doesn't mean that anyone in the church has um, less dignity or less respect or is less valuable. Yeah. Um, it's just a certain order that God has decided to institute. And it's yeah, for the yeah. good of people. I think that that's what's often missed mm. is that he gives these structures. He gives these roles. He gives these distinctions not to be oppressive, not to burden us, not to make us say, oh, God, why do you always have this like new rule for me? Yeah. Um, but it's to actually liberate us. It's to give us um, a direction and a path that will lead to our flourishing as opposed to our demise. Mm. Um, and I think that's also an important part of the conversation. Yeah. But yeah, I don't want to take too much more time on it. But I would argue that the world is actually the one that has a low view of women. You know, oh, from, yes. from from what we see in the pornography industry, from what we see in movies, what's, Absolutely. what's being taught in shows and stuff like that, like that's really where, and that's what's unfortunately, you know, taints our brains. You know, it, it makes us see now women in an objectified way where, yeah. you know, now when I walk outside the streets because of what I've been seeing, what I've been, you know, <laughs> burning my eyes with on television or on a, on a computer, then now I'm going to objectify women as well because that's what I'm being taught. Yeah, you know, so yeah, it's actually the complete opposite to what the Bible actually teaches. Absolutely, or women. <laughs> Absolutely, I have a. This is dropping on Monday, this Friday. <laughs> I have an interview with Nancy Piercy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Nancy Piercy. Okay, she wrote a book several years back called "Love Thy Body," and mm -hmm. she talks about that how the Christian ethic actually values women more than any other mm -hmm. worldview. More than anything that you can imagine, the Christian worldview respects and dignifies women more than anyone else because mm. the Christian worldview is the only one that will lead to human flourishing, mm. right? The world, like you said, it tells you, hey, now's not the right time to be a mother. Mm. You know, let's terminate this pregnancy because it's yeah. not the right time to be a mother. Yeah, yeah. Um, completely diminishing your body, completely diminishing a mm. part of what God made you for. And they do this to men too, but we're talking about women right now. Um, just two guys talking about women, <laughs> but, but yes, no, I a hundred percent. Thank you for saying that. Yes. The, the scriptures, the Bible, the, the story of Christianity elevates women mm. to the highest standard, uh, more than any other worldview, more than any other religion, more than feminism mm. will trick you into believing, yeah. um, Christianity actually offers true fulfillment, true hope and true flourishing, um, for women. But thank you for bringing that up. That's actually a great point. Mm. Yeah. That's all I have on. No, that's perfect. We can go we can go to the second one. The second misconception is that the Bible is a corrupted document which has been changed throughout the years and therefore we cannot know what it said. Hmm. So you sorry, you probably have heard this if you're watching. Man, the Bible's so old, it's been edited so many times. It's no it's not accurate anymore. The hmm. true meaning, that's the quote, so the yeah, true yeah. meaning has been lost. Yeah, I was actually curious to know what you thought on this. Uh, you know, I know you went to, you know, Bible school and uh, so you graduate, you're going for your doctorate. And so I'm curious to know what they taught you about, you know, what, how the Bible, you also read a lot of translations and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You read the Hebrew uh, and Greek as well, I believe. Uh, so what were your uh, thoughts on this subject of it being corrupted? Yeah. So talking about how the scriptures are translated. Let's talk about that first mm. so that we have an understanding. Um, there was no printing press when these scriptures were first being translated. Um, there was no light bulbs when these scriptures <laughs> were first being translated. So what you had was you had a scribe, somebody who would sit down and he would have a paper and he would say, okay, this is the original copy over here. And I'm going to make a copy of that one. Mm. So he starts writing in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. The Bible is pretty long. Uh, <laughs> you can only go so far with until you make a mistake. Yeah. Right. So you would make a mistake here. You'd make a mistake there. You'd make a mistake here. Um, so here's here's a statistic. This is true. There are more variants in the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament. Mm. There are more places where we have 
errors and confusion, then there are places, then there are words in the New Testament. Mm. So that shocks people. Yeah. That shocks people because that's that's our holy book. That's the book that we say <laughs> we put all of our stock in. Yeah. Um, but if you look at a Greek New Testament, they have these little markings for where there's a mistake or there's mm. like some discrepancy between manuscripts. Um, they have little markings there. Mm. And the New Testament is filled with them. Any page you turn, you're going to have hundreds of them. And there's <laughs> even more than that because they can't mark all of them. Because if they marked all of them, you couldn't even read the Bible because mm. there's that many variants in the New Testament. Dang. Yeah. So, <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's what we have to consider. What kind of variants? Because mm. not all variants are the same. Yeah. Is the meaning being changed? And it turns out that in 99.98% of the situations, the meaning that the gospel or that the scriptures want to present is not changed. Mm. What is usually changed is spelling. <laughs> so your name is Miguel, M-I-G-U-E-L. A scribe may be translating your name from Miguel to Maritza, and he might spell your name, your name M-I-G-E-L, mm. and miss the U. Yeah. That is the majority of the New Testament um, variants. Is spelling errors. Somebody misspelled Rome. Somebody misspelled the name Paul. Somebody misspelled the name whatever. Most of them are small errors like that that don't actually change the meaning yeah. of what the scriptures say. On top of that, on top of that, okay, so we have a document with a lot of errors, but all of the errors are pretty insignificant and you can still pretty much figure out what the text is saying. Mm. But on top of that, you don't just have one copy that you refer to. You have thousands upon thousands of copies. There are more New Testament manuscripts than there were of any other manuscript mm. ever. We have so much um, resourcing to pull from. Yeah. So if one manuscript says Miguel with no E, but then you have 10,000 manuscripts that spell it correctly, it doesn't take a genius to say, we should probably go with the one that has 10,000. <laughs> and yeah. that, that's part of the beauty of what we have in the New Testament yeah. is that because it was so important to the church, because they valued the gospel so much, they made a bunch of copies. Mm. So we're not just left with the original and then the, the copy. Mm. We don't even have the originals anymore. What we have are tens of thousands of copies. And what we do, textual criticism, what textual criticism does is it pulls together all of these tens of thousands of manuscripts in order to ascertain what the scripture most likely said. Mm. And so we actually have a scripture that is pretty darn perfect. Mm. I mean, it is, it is as well taken care of as you can possibly imagine. And on top of that, if you wanted to believe in the reliability of the scriptures even more, on top of that, it wasn't just the copies of the Bible that they had. The early church fathers, when they were writing their commentaries on the Bible, mm -hmm. um, Augustine might write, and then the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm. And he quotes scripture. So we can use those early church father quotations mm. and look at the scriptures and see how even those match. That's good. And last thing you can recreate pretty much the entire New Testament just off of the quotations of the church fathers. Almost the entire New Testament. Dang. That is how much documentation we have of the New Testament. So while it may seem like a very catchy thing to say that it's old and it's not been preserved and there's so many mistakes, you can't trust it. It is actually the most trustworthy ancient document that exists. Yeah. Um, so... Those are my thoughts since you yeah, asked, no, but I don't know if you no, had something great. to add on or jump in. That is great. Um, man, you said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I geek I geek out over ancient languages, manuscripts, uh, textual criticism, anything like that. Yeah. I geek out. It's, it's the kind of stuff that I love. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. You guys are already here first. Go get yeah. a Bible. <laughs> uh, man, I think one of the things that came to my mind um, – was actually the quote you just said, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, the Bible might have kind of like you were saying, right? The variants, but it never uh, goes away from the true witnessing of who Jesus Christ was. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't stay um, the the history that comes with it, right? The historical landmarks, the historical figures that we see. The resurrection. Yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. And so like all that points back to Jesus. And I think 
if we were to say that it is corrupted, then we're saying that Jesus is corrupted. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's saying, because we see, the Bible says that Jesus became, is the living word. Mm -hmm. You know, he is incarnated. And when we believe, if somebody were to say it's corrupted, then you have to challenge the, the mere fact that Jesus came and dwelt mm -hmm. among us. And so I think that's something that's very important to consider when it comes to, yeah. sure, there is different uh, translations of the Bible. Uh, there is variants in the Bible, mm. but it does not change the fact that Jesus was a true historical figure. Like he did come and live. He did resurrect, yeah. you know, like, and so I think that's something that's very powerful to remind us that uh, we can trust the word, you mm -hmm. know, that we can believe it and we can apply it to our lives and it, it it isn't so much that uh, there's been changes in it. Because I think, I don't know too much on this. Um, you might maybe want to add to this. Um, the Reformation, right? In the 1600, where that's where it's split, mm -hmm. uh, where they started to determine what doctrines should be in the Bible and what should it. Uh, that's where the Catholic Church adopted the, what was it, the Beatitudes or not the Beatitudes, I'm sorry. Um, there's a name. Uh, I forgot the name of it. Uh, but they adopted certain books of the Bible. Oh, uh, the Apocrypha. There you go. Uh, into theirs. And we, uh, in the 16th century, like they were formed from that. And so that's where I feel like some people also like tend to, you know, well, should we trust that, that men, you know, people who just me and you decided that this was true and this wasn't. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you'd want to add to that where. Yeah. Well, there is, there is a sense in which theology will continue to develop until the Lord returns. Mm. So there will probably be another reformation in a couple of hundred years or in a couple mm. of decades. Like it's going to happen because theology is continually evolving yeah. um, all through church history. It wasn't just that split, um, but all throughout church history, there has been, there has been these quote unquote reformations happening. You know, the, when they were fighting against the Arianists, when they were fighting against these, when they were, um, claiming heresy X is heresy and all of that. So that's mm. been happening all of the way through. Um, and so where we have to differentiate is like, okay, what are the essentials of the faith? Yeah. Like there's, there's an inside bubble. This is the essentials of the faith. These are the most important things. And these we cannot waver on, mm. you know, it's by grace alone, faith alone and Christ alone um, that he is the incarnate son of God. He is not the brother of Satan like the the Mormons say, he's not <laughs> like he's not a human that became a God eventually mm. glorified. Like, no, he is the eternal God himself. Right. right. There are these things. There's more. But there are these things that are in the center. These are the most important things. Mm. We can't deviate from these. Yeah. And then you open up the bubble. OK, now there's some things that aren't essential for the faith, but are pretty important. Mm. And this is where you get into things like maybe transubstantiation. Okay. Does the body be, does the bread become the flesh of Jesus and the wine become his blood? You know, it's not essential to the faith. You can be a transubstantiationist and I'm okay with that. Like I disagree with you, but you're, you can be a Christian. That's not a problem. Right. So then the, the, it gets a little bit wider. Okay. And then there's another layer and these are less important theological topics and they're, they get further and further out. Mm. Right. So when we're talking about theology and how it develops, uh, a lot of it comes down to where we draw these markers. Yeah. What do we think is the most important? Because if anything falls for me, if anything falls outside of these immediate like five essential core doctrines or whatever, I have a little bit more, mm. a little bit more grace. And I think that that's part of the problem with maybe Christianity sometimes is we're so quick to turn on each other. As soon as people start disagreeing with some of these outer doctrines, we start to like get mad and we start to get defensive and we start to fight. And you know who's watching? The outside world. Yeah. And they're looking at us, man, these people can't even like get it together. They're here bickering and they're fighting about mm. this and that. And they tell me that they have a book that has truth. They can't even agree on it. So yeah. why follow them? You know, and really it, when it comes down to it, we're not even fighting over essentials. Mm. You know, should we sprinkle babies? Should we dump them? Or should we just put a little bit of water over their head? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good. You know, I, I think you should fully be immersed in water but if you want to get sprinkled that's all good in the hood you know yeah. so i think that's part of that conversation is where we draw these lines and how rigid we are with them um but i think i've deviated from your original question oh, yeah, so you're, you're <laughs> my bad i rambled <laughs> no i think yeah i think apart from the actual text uh and the actual bible what tends to bring up that question for people that it's corrupted it's the way we live our lives mm -hmm. it's a way that people are seeing us because once we become once you claim to be a Bible believing Christian, you know, like you, you believe in Jesus, 
and people know that you mm. are a target now because people are going to see you and you are going to be witnessing to the world yeah what the what do you truly believe what the bible says right right do you truly have conviction about what it says and are right. you going to really live it out and so that that starts to bring questions like man well this person's saying that mm. uh, i don't know lust is wrong but yeah he's joking around with his co-workers at work with some woman that they saw yeah what is that going to say about his testimony hypocrisy yeah, yeah. yeah and so i think that starts to make people consider like well maybe what he's believing isn't true like, right you know and so it starts bringing uh some sort of false witnessing i guess to those around him and that gets very dangerous in the world uh especially because we are being seen by everyone right? yeah we are being seen by those who don't believe and those who are trying to share the gospel with and basically are gonna you know we're tainting the the uh the grounds that we're trying to spread seeds to you know yeah. and so that's very careful on how um well we are talking about the bible being corrupted our lives are actually also <laughs> part of the effect of that yeah no that's true there's no um there's no greater ruiner of a good testimony than hypocrisy i think mm. i think i think that's fair no, I think I think you hit it on the head. And that's why no one ever questions Mother Teresa. <laughs> I've never genuinely met a person that was like, oh, Mother Teresa, nah, she was all talk, bro. She don't know what she's <laughs> no one. No one. Because she walked the walk better than anyone. Yeah, yeah. She was she was walking the walk. She was a straight arrow. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, let's go to the third one. Uh, the third misconception is that pastors have it all together. Mm. Why don't you kick why don't you kick us off on that one? <laughs> Man, I um I've been to a couple of churches <laughs> and I've always worked really close with pastors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, unfortunately, sometimes some pastors do want to present an image that they do have it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when things start to fall apart, that will raise questions as to, man, well, I thought as a pastor, you're supposed to have an answer to every question. Yep. Uh, you're supposed to, you know, be the most loving person that there is. Uh, you're supposed to show the most grace towards everyone. And so there's that misconception where it's like, well, we, now you're putting them on a pedestal, yep. right? And so that's where we start to be wrong, where it's like, man, well, these people are supposed to have it all together, when in reality, they struggle with the same sins that we struggle with. Right. Uh, they are tempted by the same things we are tempted by. Uh, they are under the same headship, which we all are under, which is Christ. Right, yeah, uh, absolutely. And so at the end of the day, they may they don't have it all together mm -hmm. uh but they are to be an uh an example they're exemplars right they they should be exemplars of the faith where they are more caution with how they live yeah uh, they are more careful with how uh they're walking around in public uh, they are more careful with how they they lead you uh how they counsel you why because they are held in a higher accountability uh than most of us would Right. The Bible talks about that, how those who are in a elder position are going to be held accountable at a higher way. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the unfortunate side is that that we tend to put pastors uh, in some sort of pedestal and that probably puts an even bigger weight on them. Yeah. Uh, and so that's so far what I've kind of witnessed uh, with uh, how pastors are viewed and how you know they we say they have it all together but in reality man they they need friends <laughs> you yeah. know like they need friends and don't be afraid to be your pastor's friend because right man because people think they have it all together we are afraid to talk to them we're afraid to approach them we're afraid to bring them over home uh, to other house gathering yeah uh and so pastors pastors are some of the loneliest people in America. Dude, yeah. I don't know why I said America in the world, but I'm an American. So I know in America, <laughs> I know in America, pastors are some of the loneliest people in the world. Yeah. And and they're always giving of themselves, mm. you know, but it's it's rare when they actually receive. Yeah. So I mean, I, you've been a youth pastor. You've been, you know, you are now a, a pastor at your church. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the, you know, I guess, some of the things that you've gone through where people have thought either you had it all together or you were supposed to have yeah know, or if you've gone through anything like that you don't have i'm not 100 sure if yeah no i mean i i agree pretty much what you said you just went down my notes <laughs> you know there i even said like there is some level of spiritual maturity mm -hmm. that is mandated in the scriptures you know you can't just be like a new believer you have to 
there's there's some requirements for pastors in the yeah. in the Bible. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have it all together, that we have it all together. It doesn't mean that we all of a sudden have purged all of the sin out of our lives. It doesn't mean that our pet peeves just miraculously disappear. Mm. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden my pride has been completely done away with. Like none of that. Yeah. Um, there, there is there is still struggle and there is still difficulty there, um, just like anyone else. Um, except that sometimes pastors don't necessarily have somewhere to take that. Mm. Um, hopefully every pastor does have someone that they can trust and that they can talk to about what's happening, but that's not always the case. And therefore you have these pastors sometimes that are just, they know that something's wrong, mm -hmm. but they have no one to address it with because the congregation can't know that. Yeah. Um. So, so the world says, Um. and I think that's part of the problem is that mm. I think sometimes the standards that people put on pastors are, are unrealistic Maybe unrealistic is a wrong word. They're unattainable. Mm. Um, nobody can be as holy as the people want the pastor to be. Yeah. It would be it would be nice. It would be ideal. Um, but but that's Jesus's role. Mm. You know, uh, the way Glenn Lafitte, uh, you know, Glenn, the way Glenn says it is we're just beggars showing other beggars where to get bread. Mm. I'm not superior. I don't have more value, dignity, honor, or respect. That's good. It's just this is what I've chosen to do with my life. I've chosen to serve the Lord through my teaching ministry and through my pastoring. Um, but I still get angry with my wife, you know, <laughs> there's still bad. There's still days when we go to bed and we're still mm. like in a fight or whatever. And that's yeah. just, that's just the reality of life on this side of heaven. Mm. So, so no pastors do not have it all together um, because nobody on this side of heaven has it all together. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think um, in Acts, I have written down Acts 20, 28, just pay careful attention to yourselves. And this is mm -hmm. uh, Paul talking to Ephesians and, and the elders. Uh, and so one of the things he's saying, right, is to you got to look deep in, within yourselves as pastors. They're actually, man, probably more burdened by their sin uh, because of, you know, having to lead others. Yeah. Uh, and so they have to be careful by that. Yeah. Uh, there's a book called The Reformed Pastor. Um, he says, uh, where did I write it down? Let's see. I believe it's here. Uh, pastors are held to a higher accountability, but it does not mean they have it all together. It just means that they will attempt to keep themselves above reproach, as Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 2. And so basically, right, they, they don't have it all together, uh, but they are to also be above reproach. Mm -hmm. They are to be the ones who people can come to uh, and that they won't be any false witnessing uh right. towards them uh they have to keep themselves accountable where if anything does come up like no like they were doing well right um but yeah uh I, that's something that i, I had read a read earlier like, oh. no that's good i think i think that pretty much will sum <laughs> that that question up because the misconception is pastors have it all together and the mm -hmm. answer is no one has it all together yeah. pastors included easy yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, let's go to the fourth one. The church only wants my money. Dun, dun, dun. Money talks. <laughs> money talks. Here's, here's the truth. Some churches only want your money. <laughs> Unfortunately. That, that is that's why truth. the misconception is there, mm. because it's true. It's just not true of every church. There are some churches that are not just looking for your money, mm. um, but because the ones that are looking for your money are usually the ones that end up in the news because of some scandal or because of something mm. like that. Those are the ones you think of. Um, you never think of the 85-year-old pastor that's been at the same church for 50 years and they drive a 2004 Toyota Camry and <laughs> they're not looking to make a billion dollars. You know, you don't think of them. You think yeah. of the very rich um, pastor. Hey, what's that Instagram account called? Uh, oh, pastors sneakers and, and sneakers and preachers sneakers and preachers yeah, yeah you're thinking yeah. of sneakers and preachers <laughs> um but it turns out that's not the majority of churches mm. that is a very few select churches globally okay globally these churches because most churches are actually in rural places that don't have more than 75 members um a lot of them are underground churches mm. so so most churches do not want your money but unfortunately because of the few churches that do, it kind of ruins the reputation for all of the rest. 
unfortunately as well is the algorithm that you're probably going to see most of those churches mm -hmm. in your youtube videos yeah uh, in your TikTok. yeah you know, they have the money for seo yeah. <laughs> they have the money for the fancy cameras Dude. meanwhile old people baptist church and old people wisconsin yeah. has like a flip phone that they're using to record still so you don't no, even know the that, is that that's a good observation yeah, yeah. good point uh, good point matt i think that one of the things my pastor likes to say a lot is that giving doesn't start with your wallet it starts it starts with your belief of the gospel mm. you know that is the center of when it comes to uh giving at your local church i think that's another thing right it's if you are a member of the church mm -hmm. uh, and you are convicted and you are driven to give towards your church uh, for the need, uh, you know, for what you see, you know, what the Lord has placed in your heart out of obedience, uh, that is when we start giving. You know, mm -hmm. if you are a first day attendee, uh, the church doesn't want your money. You know, they want to lead you to Christ. Right. And, and so <laughs> if it's the opposite of that, then I would say run. Right. Like if they're asking for your money on day one, then maybe you should keep looking uh <laughs> but the 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 center of what it means to you know give to the church it really does come uh from what we know of the gospel mm -hmm. we give because man we have been offered something freely and when we give to the church when we give finances specifically uh we don't give because we're going to get back right we're, we don't give because man the lord's going to bless me even more uh, we give out of pure obedience to continue to see the gospel flourish. And if we could meet a need in a certain way, we're going to try to meet it. Right. Uh, and we might not see the fruit of that. I think some of us give money and I've, you know, I consider myself in that when I'll give money, hoping to see the fruit from it. And I don't <laughs> to this day, right? Like sometimes we're going to give faithfully and it's not because we're going to get something in return. Right. It's because we understand the gospel and we believe in Jesus and we're just going right. to give to see that continue to flourish in other people, meeting other people's needs and trusting our church that they're using these funds to, you know, share with the world. Right. Yeah. And I think also part of the issue for me when I think about this question is like when all of a sudden things that aren't necessarily mandated become mandates. Mm. For example, the tithe. I don't I don't believe that the tithe is applicable or I don't think that the tithe is a requirement for for Christians. Mm. It was an Old Testament um, practice that I think was done away with when we entered into like mm. the 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 church age. Um, which, by the way, um, the tithe in the Old Testament was not ten percent. Mm. People don't know this. It was ten percent <laughs> of this, and ten percent of this, oh, and then ten percent. There was like there was like five <laughs> there was like five different tithes. Oh, in the yeah. Old Testament system. And I think all in all, they added up to like almost 30% of your total income. Oh, so if a church says that they want to practice the tithe the way the Jewish people practiced it, you go broke. <laughs> they're well, yeah. The people are, the church is not, the people are. So, but I think that's one of the things like, oh, the church only wants my money mm. because they start hitting you with this is what you have to do 10% to the penny. If yeah. you make $99 and 99 cents and you have to give nine dollars and ten cents, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I think that that's part of it is it just becomes this burden that not even Jesus asked, Yeah, you know, because in the, in the new Testament, it says that it's about a cheerful giver. It's about yeah. giving out of the abundance of your heart. It's about giving out of the love that you have, mm. not because there's like a barometer that you have to meet and like get your giving to a certain place. Um, so I think that that's part of it is that in many ways, the church has instituted things that the Lord or Paul or the early church never really instituted. Mm. It was always supposed to be free. And I wouldn't say burden free because there's burden when you give, it has to be sacrificial, obviously. Um, but there wasn't a requirement. And therefore, if you missed one week of tithing because you got a flat tire and you needed to replace a tire, uh, there was no guilt there because mm. it's out of abundance that you give. It's out of, yeah. of, of love that you give. So, so I think that's another part uh, of the conversation there. And I would echo what you said. Um, what the church primarily wants is for your soul to be saved, mm. a good church. What they primarily yeah. want is to see you become a Christian and then to take that Christian life and begin to transform your world and extend that, you know, mm. create an Eden in your home and then begin to create an Eden outside of your home and mm. spread the goodness of God as far as you can extend it while he gives you the ability. After that, out of that, 
Um, sure, we want to give you the opportunity to to be a part of doing that in someone else's life. But like you said, we don't lead with that. Mm. It's not about, hey, give me your money first, and I'm going to tell you how to become a Christian. Yeah. Right. That's 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 the wrong mentality. That's the opposite. Um, I'm curious. Have you ever been guilted into giving? Oh my goodness, a million times. Malachi, <laughs> is it Malachi or Micah? It's with the M. <clears throat> how have you robbed God mm. with your tithes and your offerings? <laughs> you know. Um, yes, I have. I have. I've never been manipulated to it. Mm. I have been, people have tried to manipulate me to time. <laughs> um, but I, I, I've never done it. Mm. I've never done it. It's always been something that like, no, I know what the Lord is asking of me. And look, I'm not trying to say that I'm stingy with my wallet. Like, mm. well, I'm not going to say what I do because then it's going <laughs> to sound prideful, but no, whatever, whatever. There, there are missionaries that we support like every single month. Like we give to the church um, generously. Like we, we do that stuff. Mm -hmm. The key is nobody's beating me over the head with the Bible, forcing me to give. Yeah. Nobody's telling me that if I don't give, then I'm robbing God. N none of that. It's just, we want to give you the opportunity to give. Mm -hmm. If God puts it in your heart, go ahead. Yeah. Um, now I will, I will give the other side of that. I think the Lord does ask us to be sacrificial in our giving. I'm not saying like, just give two pennies because that's all you, whatever. It's just, yeah. I have to do it. Here you go. Like there should be some consideration. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some extent, to some extent, um, what we do with our money reflects the value that we put in our lives. Mm -hmm. If I spend 95% of my income on movie theater tickets and I give absolutely nothing to the church, um, maybe there's some discrepancy there. Maybe I need to go to the movies one time less a month and give a little bit more to the church. You know, I wouldn't make that a hard and fast rule. Um, but our monies do reveal our where our devotion is mm. to some extent. Yeah, that's good. So so both are true. And I don't want to give anyone a pass to just not be generous ever, um, because generosity is important, but yeah. there's a balance that needs to be stricken. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Nice. Yeah. So next one. Let's do it. Let's do it. The next one. Uh number five. The God of the Old Testament is wrathful and angry. But the God of the New Testament is compassionate and loving. Woo! You can start this one. <laughs> Matt, I think this one's one where we uh, have, I think this also goes back to the way some churches uh, practice uh, their theology. Mm -hmm. When it comes to we only preach one half of the book. Uh, we only teach the loving side of God. Uh, I have a friend with the testimony who talks about uh, he was in a certain organization and he was helping out uh, teaching. And so it came down to uh, he was going through five steps and one of them was talking about hell towards the youth. And when he spoke about hell, they kind of like reprimanded him about it. Like, oh, hey, man, yeah. Don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think that was a little too deep. Uh, and so he kind of just like, what do you mean? Like, I can't just do half the truth, you know, like, yeah. Like what, if there is no hell or separation from God, like, what yeah. are you saved from? Yeah. How can, so <laughs> how can you even, how can you even become a Christian dude? Yeah. Without wrestling with like the consequences of sin. And anyways, I, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I mean, no, you're good. Uh, and so I think that's the, that's one of the misconceptions we have because we have separated mm. wrath from love. It's like, if we believe that God is all one, right. It's every, he has, he has given us love. He has given us, you know, every emotion that we could feel. Like, how has he, how does he not express us as well? Yeah. Right. And so from the beginning, from uh, we see the the flood, you know, we could think to ourselves, man, like, how is that, you know, how is that my God? Right. Right. Uh, I've heard people express that. Uh, even myself, when I first came to faith, right. Like I'll quote like, man, like how, mm. this, this is kind of bad. And if you read a lot of the old Testament, man, there is, some crazy stuff that happened, right? Like the Lord yep. was sovereign over a lot of killing that you see. And it's like, mm. oh, what's happening here? Which that's another topic you could talk about where it's like murder and killing. Yeah. Um, like whole other thing. Or another cool. podcast. Yeah, yeah. Or another day. I'll write it down. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that at the end of the day, Jesus came to, uh, man, he demonstrated the Lord's uh, sovereignty and power and apart from love he also uh shared about his wrath uh he talked a lot about the end of times right uh he talked about how you know there is going to come a time where there's going to be gnashing of teeth you know mm -hmm. and so it's one of those things where 
uh, we tend to that's later <laughs> you right. know like and so it's like let's just focus on the now where it's like yeah, it's love and grace it's peace right. and what's going to happen when you know uh, the Lord does come back in his glory and now it's like those people who only knew about love are now uh, what's the word uh, in shock right like you know, like whoa 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 like what's going on like, where did like, this come from yeah and so yeah. like now they're gonna be in right. some sort of mm. um uh in awe but like in terror and not so much of like mm. man this is the lord coming back yeah. yeah yeah i think that there's a there's a side to this where people have and i think you hinted at this people have just they have viewed wrath they have viewed anger and love is opposites mm. when anger and love are not opposites in fact one requires the other if i'm going to love something mm -hmm. i'm going to hate something that's good uh, example today um in preparation to your coming i went to the gym before you came so i took a shower afterwards and we were washing the the floor mat um we were washing it so all of the floor the tile got all wet mm. right so 10 minutes later, my son goes in there and he slips on the wet floor straight onto tile right on the back of his head mm. and he hits himself. And I hated that that happened, mm. but I hated it because I loved him. So when you love something, you have a natural hate of anything mm. that tries to harm that. That's it's good. just a natural response. I hate, um, I can't say this word on YouTube or I'll get demonetized. Yeah. <laughs> I hate, um, the murder of children. Mm. And that is why I hate clinics that murder children mm. um, because I love children and I think that they deserve life. Yeah. Right. So love um, by its definition must hate as well. Mm. So this is not um, God being schizophrenic. <laughs> schizophrenic is the wrong word. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not God with a split personality mm. where one day he's like, Oh, I love everything. Oh, I hate everything. It's not mm. like that. It's because he is consistent with himself yeah. as he loves he simultaneously hates mm. and the misconception was that in the old testament god is an angry bully and in the new testament he is this loving fairy essentially yeah right that's the misconception but if you go to the old testament exodus 34 verse 6 i don't know if you have a bible on your on your ipad i do okay exodus 34 verse 6 it talks about him being loving and compassionate even in the old testament so even in the Old Testament, where people think he's just a bully and mean, he's actually displayed as loving, kind, and compassionate. So Exodus 34, 6. Oh, 6. I was on 36. I'm like, it's 36, bro. No, no, 34, 6. <laughs> okay. It is. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Yeah. So steadfast love, that's the Hebrew word mm. hesed which everybody knows. If you don't know, just Google it. Um, but hesed, and it doesn't just say that he has some hesed. Mm. What was the word that it said? Love and steadfast, um, what is it? Abounding and steadfast. Abounding. He yeah. doesn't just have a little bit. He is abounding in it. The thing that is overflowing mm. out of God is hesed, is mm. this loving kindness. It's a loyal love. That's what it means by loving kindness. Yeah. It's a loyal love. It's a love that loves against conditions. It's a love that loves um in the in the worst of times it's a love that is unceasing and that is the very thing that he's abounding with you know if i fill this cup of water and i just keep filling it it's going to start pouring over mm. that is god with his hesed it just continues and it flows and flows we can't measure it we can't try to cup it it just continues to overflow because he abounds in it that's good so that's the old testament in the old testament he's abounding with that and then in the new testament in Revelation, you hinted at this as well. Jesus is presented as being someone who who has wrath. Mm. He comes back and he has a sword and he's using it, yeah. right? He's putting an end to sin. He's putting an end to Satan. He's putting an end to death itself. And he is being portrayed as, mm. as angry. I mean, yeah. he he is coming with, with the full force of the wrath of God on the enemies of God. Mm. Um. And so, yeah, it is a misconception to put these two attributes of God against each other, his hate and his love, uh, because really they are unified and united mm. in the one person of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if you had anything else to add or tag on to that. No, yeah, I think I think you hit it right on, right, with um, Jesus is the unified, you know, both of the old and new. And so that's really good. But I don't, I don't have anything else to add on to that. Right. Yeah. So 
we'll go to we'll go to the last one the final misconception um of christianity is that to be a christian i have to align with one particular political party mm. and often not all the time often that in america would be the republican party mm. that's the misconception that if you're going to be a christian you are going to align with one particular political party asterisk probably republican in america <laughs> right that's what you see in the news that's what yeah. people say uh, but miguel your thoughts Man, I think this is one where we could probably do a whole podcast on, yeah, because uh, it is a very big and it's it's a misconception. It's a real big one when it comes to politics. Uh, mm -hmm. You have the whole themes that we've seen probably around uh, all social media, where you know, should you be Republican? Should we be Democratic? Uh, should they even mix your Christianity and politics? Mix? Right. Yeah. Uh, Separation of church and yeah, state. Yeah. So we have, which, by the way, originally. That was for the protection of the church, mm. but now it's been flipped around. Originally, it was so that the government couldn't say, well, church, you can't do this. There was a separation. The church did its own thing because they were coming from mm. a place where the government regulated the church, mm. um, Europe, right, with the yeah. Anglican church out there and everything. And they came to America and they wanted separation. So it was originally for the protection of the church, but mm. now it's turning into a thing where the church can't have a voice and the church yeah. can't anyways no, yeah, that's yeah. neither here nor there that's good um matt I, I think that that's the that's where it gets hard because it's like that's what we've been indoctrinated with mm -hmm. you know since we were small we're taught about you know uh politics in the sense of like you know through church uh you know i was raised a catholic uh and so they taught us about that you know you you are to be in a, a law-abiding citizen uh, you should believe these things. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, politicians who believe in these are what you should. You They're know, the be, Christian politics. Yeah. Like, right. This is what you should be voting for. Right. Um, and so if this aligns with this, then that's the right one. Right. Uh, and so that's where it's kind of hard because there is uh, one particular belief, right, that I think we all have a very uh, similar take to, which is the one you mentioned a little earlier mm -hmm. uh, with the clinics and all that. Like, that's the one where we tend to, because... Mm -hmm this man says this and believes in this, like, this is what we're going to do, uh, or this is what we're going to vote for. Right. Uh, and that's where it's kind of like, man, like, yeah. But what about their character? Right. right. Like, and so I was hearing this podcast earlier as well, where they talk about that. They talk mm -hmm. about, man, well, uh, they talk about character. And if they believe in this one thing that aligns with Christianity, like, but their characters is completely opposite. Then yeah. What, like, what, what makes someone a Christian politician, right? If they believe one thing about, or they support one of the Christian yeah. agendas, but then the other 900, they like turn their back on. Like, are they a Christian politician really? Yeah. I see what you're saying. And so that's where it's, yeah. man, like, it's so a, where, where do we fall on? Right. right. Like, yeah. should we have a political yeah. party? Uh, how well educated should we be when it comes to that? Right. Because it doesn't only affect, uh, you know, our belief. Like, if I'm being completely honest, sometimes I was forced and I convinced myself to uh, vote Republican in the sense mm -hmm. because... Man, I didn't want to feel guilty that if I voted the other one, man, yeah. well, I'm condemning, you know, babies type of thing. And so I'm yeah. condemning, you know, the whole nation to, man, this is good. No, and, like, and so it's, it's, it was, they're good questions to wrestle with. Yeah. yeah. And so it's one of those where I'm like, man, like, well, I'm just going to vote this way because, you know, that's that's where it should be. And I feel less guilty about it. Uh, but in reality, it's, it's one where we really have to come down to, um, you know, what do they believe? You know, what what is their character? Yeah. How are they acting in public? Right. Uh, how do they carry themselves as Christians mm. that they say they are? And so that's one where if you're going to align your views in a political way, uh, it might be one to sure, you know, pray about it, uh, you know, view them. Uh, because if we narrow it down to political standards, like, it's it's one of those where it's going to fall under the leadership yeah. right it's not just republican or democratic yeah uh, it's going to be who is representing that right you and know? before i think before we even get to that conversation like just acknowledging the moment that you say in order to be a christian you have to align with political party mm. x you have functionally and effectively added on to the gospel mm. added on to the requirements of christianity i should say that's good uh, because jesus did not say believe in me, support this political party, and ye shall be saved. Yeah. Um, so once we start talking about you have to support candidate X, 
Mm. You have to support political party. Why? Um, that is extra biblical. Obviously, that is not like that's not true. Yeah, because that's not that's not what the scriptures talk about. So we're beginning to we're beginning to add um, stumbling blocks to people, mm. um, and that's that's an issue. Um, political party X may have a great view on all of these Christian issues, and political Y may have a terrible view. Whatever. Um, we're still adding to the scriptures what it requires to be a Christian mm. because it's by faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone, not yeah, by yeah. faith alone and grace alone, political party. And you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think that, that that is a good starting point. And Tim Keller talked about this a lot, is that you you can't make Jesus fit any political party. You can't. They, they tried in the New Testament. Mm. They brought him. They put some money in front of him. And they mm. said, hmm, what do you think about the political um idea of taxes mm. should we pay taxes jesus and it says that jesus knew that they were trying to trap him <laughs> and so jesus says give to caesar's what is caesar's and give to god what is god mm. and he doesn't he doesn't even entertain the conversation right they were asking him a political question what side of the political aisle do you fall on are you pro this tax are you against this tax what are you going to say yeah doesn't even make mention of it he says <laughs> politics will worry about politics but you be about the things of god yeah and he refused to be put into that bubble and here we are in 2024 and we're trying to make jesus the the leader of political party this mm. or the political party this or That's whatever right. um when he himself did not do that he had the opportunity too it's not like oh he just never got around to it because they murdered him mm. like no he had the opportunity they they talked a lot about his kingdom which is very, it's a political thing to have a kingdom on the earth. Yeah. They talked about his earthly kingdom. They talked about the taxes. Um, he had meetings with, with, uh, with the officials and they asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And all of those things. He had political conversations, but he never took a side. He never said, this is the side that I'm taking. Yeah. He let people just breathe in that and, and figure that out. Um, another thing Tim Keller would say a lot is that in either political party, there is going to be God honoring things mm. in either one. There is not one party that fully encapsulates Christianity uh, yeah. because only Christianity fully encapsulates Christianity. True. Um, so the Republican Party in America perhaps has a high view of children and doesn't want them being killed. Mm. Very God honoring. What a good thing, right? Christians can say, yes, keep babies alive. Mm. Um, on the other side, the Democratic Party Maybe they're thinking about like climate change and taking care of the earth. Whether you yeah. believe in climate change or not, their <laughs> intentions are we want to care for the earth because it's the only one we've got. Mm. Well, the scriptures say we should do that. Genesis tells us we should care for the earth. We should steward it well. We should use its resources. Mm. We shouldn't exploit it, but we should care for it and serve it. And so either way you look at it, they each have things that they're fighting for that are that are represented in the in the scriptures as Christians should do these things. And so it becomes incredibly narrow-minded, um, I would say even unloving, to put that as a burden on someone to say, if you don't agree with me, you can't be a Christian. Mm. I mean, that sounds like Satan's work to me. Yeah, It's kind of extreme to say it that way, and maybe that's an exaggeration, but, uh, but where is the grace? Where is the compassion? Where is the acceptance? Where is the commitment mm. to by faith alone grace alone and christ alone yeah um good. so those are just the thoughts that are kind of flowing out of me i don't know if you have a response to that yeah no i think that's real good uh because at the end of the day you don't need to really you know have a political party in mind when it comes to christianity right you know it, it's not a matter of you know i believe in this i believe in that then i should like those shouldn't be our first thoughts when we trying to come to christ right you know like it's right christ like i need you and that's it you know right. like, he's the one that would bring conviction to our lives yeah uh, as to how we live our lives yeah you know what are we going to be we want to be exemplars of christ not so much of a political party right you know and so at the yeah. end of the day like that's that's really what we want to do yeah uh, and, and if so you put a if you put a global hat on there is no republican party in zimbabwe <laughs> yeah you know peru doesn't have the republican mm. party so if we're saying that to be a Christian, you have to align with this political party. That goes what about what about all the non-Americans that have You're never given us, bro. <laughs> to, right? And I know what they're saying to the beliefs of the political party, but it's still just, it's a little bit narrow is all I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. That's no, good. Yeah. Well, 
we have no more misconceptions. So unless you have something that you want to close us off with, man, I think I, I think that's it. I don't have anything else that I could add on to, uh, apart from, um, you know, if you have been struggling with any of these misconceptions, right. If there is anything that, uh, you have in mind that has caused you to have some sort of, um, strain away from Christ or struggling to come to Christ, uh, not only should you go to your church, a local church that maybe if you're not a part of one, but you should be able to go to your pastor. Uh, you should go, you should be able to go to, uh, you know, your fellow congregants around you where you can talk about these things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, similar, it doesn't have to be a podcast conversation, but right. it's definitely one of those where you can have intimate moments. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, don't be afraid to, you know, seek answers from questions such as these, um, where, you know, it's going to help you grow. It's going to help you mature in your faith. Uh, and it's going to hopefully make you more like Christ and hope you uh, guide you more towards Christ. Uh, and apart from that, you know, you want to go to scripture for it, uh, to seek the truth, to find truth. Uh, that is where we are going to ultimately uh, be able to seek answers and receive them through the spirit of God. Yeah. And hey, yesterday was Easter. Mm -hmm. um, but just a reminder, Easter is not a one day thing. Easter is a 50 day celebration. Mm. So for the next 49 days, since this is dropping the day after Easter, um, celebrate, celebrate the resurrection, a feast, have friends over more often, uh, drink, eat and be merry and just have a mm. good time. We just finished Lent, 40 days of fasting. And now we enter the season of Easter where we feast for 50 days, because as I've said so many times in the past couple of weeks, um, the, the feasting is always longer than the fasting. Mm. So, Hey, thanks for checking out the podcast. Super appreciate it. Uh, whenever Miguel's channel goes live, I'll post it here so that y'all can see that too. Thanks guys. Bye.